Hello and welcome back to The Guardian Film Show, perfectly positioned at the end of November as Hollywood prepares to leapfrog Christmas and pitch us headlong into awards season. Sure enough, the upcoming productions are all big Oscar contenders, although there's always a chance that a rogue turkey might conspire to come along in disguise. We need to have the conversation our governments can't. You're an American, you could well be detained. Definitely stay away from the wall. Cross it and you'll be shot. That's $20,000 for you to not do the hit. On the first week of award season, the industry gives to us three compromised players in the Johnny Depp gangster saga, Black Mass. Lips combine, then let the fire start. Two luminous lovers in the acclaimed 50s set romance, Carol. <laughs> and one, Apatosaurus and his boy in the Pixar animation, The Good Dinosaur. <laughs> But we begin with arguably the weightiest Oscar contender of them all in Bridge of Spies, a potent Cold War thriller starring Mark Rylance as a suspected Russian spy and Tom Hanks as his US defense attorney. And here's none other than Steven Spielberg to tell Catherine Shord all about it. They've got our guy, our spy pilot. They've got their guy. We want you to negotiate the swap. Are you good at what you do? This will be a first for the both of us. Why are we hanging him? He's a star! We need to know what the Russian was telling you. We're not having this conversation. You've said in the past that, that you think that Cold War surveillance is, is polite compared to what's happening now. Yes. How would you characterize what's happening now, then? Well, what happened now is everybody's sort of in everybody else's bananas. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You know, so there's just there's cyber hacking and and there's all kinds of gossip and innuendo, and there's all kinds of sports, I would call it sports spying, because mm. it's not even for trade secrets or, or, or national secrets. Not everybody is Edward Snowden, you know? You know, some stuff is just trying to, trying to get dirt on people or find out stuff that would make headlines for the snooper. It's all about this man and what he represents. He's a threat to all of us, a traitor. Who's a traitor? The Rosenbergs were traitors. Who were they? That's your sister's They side. gave atomic secrets to the Russians. They were Americans. They betrayed their country. But you can't accuse Abel of being a traitor. He's not an American. Oh, listen to yourself. You're defending him already. I'm hungry. You're rehearsing it on me. You said you were just thinking about it. I am it. just thinking about it. It's very hard. There's more news and more information that any of us could possibly ingest. And at the same time, there's um, a lot of, uh, you know, loss of, you know, you know, our own, you know, freedom of, 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 of being able to have a private life. And there's a lot of that stuff that's no longer available the way it used to be in the old analog days. The digital days have taken the private life and kind of um, made you work for it, made mm. you earn your rights to privacy. We need to know. Don't go Boy Scout on me. We don't have a rule book here. Your agent Hoffman, yeah? Yeah. German extraction. Yeah, so? My name's Donovan, Irish, both sides, mother and father. I'm Irish, you're German, but what makes us both Americans? Just one thing, one, one, one. The rule book. We call it the Constitution, and we agree to the rules, and that's what makes us Americans. It's all that makes us Americans, so don't tell me there's no rule book, and don't nod at me like that, you son of a bitch. Joined on the bridge by Peter Bradshaw and Catherine Shord. Peter, I put it to you, this is Spielberg's most sort of purely satisfying film in years. I think so. I think it is terribly satisfying. I didn't expect to be as formally and richly satisfied, as you so rightly say, that I was, really. Uh, I think it has incredible muscular storytelling flair, overwhelming confidence. It makes you kind of believe that you already knew about the story. I really didn't know anything at no. all about this story, but it made it seem immediately like a kind of an American classic. It had that Capra-esque touch, mm. uh, all to do, well, at least partly to do with, with Tom Hanks. And I, I loved it. I thought it was terrifically good. It's sort of Capra, but it's also a bit John le Carre as well. I mean, it's a very intricate, novelistic well, story. That's very, very interesting. 
what I find uh, really intriguing about the John le Carre kind of reference is that John le Carre would bring to it a kind of cynicism and coldness. nihilism and coldness, whereas Spielberg seems to have taken that mojo, turned it around 180 degrees and plugged it back in. So where you have, with John le Carre, you might have exhausted futility and cynicism and moral equivalence yeah. and they're as bad as us and we're as bad as them. Somehow Spielberg conjures up a kind of decency and moral courage and a sense that all this is worth something mm. and good. Mm. It kind of somehow takes the British Le Carre story and turns it on its head. I find that kind of intriguing and rather wonderful. Hanks is really going for the sort of Jimmy Stewart, Gregory Peck, sort of all-American decent mm. man archetype here, isn't he? He is, and actually that makes me think of it more in terms of something like a, a Hitchcock film, because you've got all that going on as well. You've got a great deal about... Um, self-portraiture and refracted imagery and and surveillance and what the camera does and, and acting what, everybody and being kind of false and it's one of those films where you know the, the whole opening sequence the chase with Mark Rylance being caught is is totally unsoundtracked mm. it's just soundtracked by the street sounds and it gives you an impression of what how, you know this is I think pretty close to a masterpiece I mean you couldn't really do it very much better and and you know you, you, you have this really inspired pairing I mean Spielberg chased Rylance about 30 years ago and he turned him down to do the ROC and he's chased him again and then he's cast him as the BFG and you can sort of see that you just needed somebody to harness Rylance and make it work on screen which nobody has been able to do before I mean before arguably Wolf Fool mm. actually but um, which was shot I think sort of uh, I don't know afterwards, but um, yeah, it is rather brilliant. And and the, th the weird thing is that he's weirdly adorable as well, Mark Ellis. And so what all this sort of dreadful uh, thing that he's the Soviet spy, and that you know we as well as the American public should be thinking, Jesus Christ, it's a traitor. <laughs> you know, he's trying mm -hmm. to, he's a terrorist, um, and you don't. And that is actually really impressive to have pulled off that narrative flip like that. It's really brilliant, and with such kind of. Elegance and, and surely in the running for best supporting actor a nomination at least. Oh, yeah I mean the, the whole film should you know, oh, I mean, it's interesting because Tom Hanks won't be in the running for best actor Even though it's a brilliantly modulated and, and impressive mm. performance to not make him revoltingly <laughs> Kind mm. of uh, high moral ground and sort of Tom Hanksy is is amazing I mean he should really get a an actor nomination, but God it's God. This is good, isn't it? Why won't he get a, a best actor nomination? Because it's not showy. It's just it's just it's it's the invisible brilliant you know, and he's this absolute, he's this absolute patriarch. He's just, but it's not a show. He doesn't, he doesn't have a scene where he does the Mark Ruffalo in Spotlight. Mm. This is what we do. This, this is, is the America. truth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, which is a real pity because it's it's brilliant work. Apparently, you're not an American citizen. That's true. And according to your boss, you're not a Soviet citizen either. Well, the boss isn't always right. But he's always the boss. Do you never worry? Would it help? Tom Hanks and Mark Rylance in The Excellent Bridge of Spies. And our cup runneth over because there is yet more excellence in our next film, Carol, directed by Todd Haynes from a novel by Patricia Highsmith and spinning a tale of forbidden love in 1950s New York. And here's Benjamin Lee sitting down with the film stars Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara. There's a lost romance with sort of the instant gratification we get from how easily it is to communicate with one another. You know, Carol and Therese have to go to great lengths to communicate with one another and they have to spend so much time apart thinking about the other person so then when they finally are together there's this sort of sigh of relief. And um, certainly in the modern age you don't get that. Oh, your perfume. Yes. It's nice. Thank you. Harge bought me a bottle years ago before we were married and I've been wearing it ever since. Harge is your husband? Mm-hmm. Well, technically we, we're divorcing. I'm sorry. Don't be. Women have long been considered hysterics, so it's something that they can be cured of, whereas, you know, love between two men is something that you have to outlaw. But obviously, in a film like um, the fact that Patricia Highsmith, when she wrote the novel back in the 50s, 51 I think it was, she had to write it under a pseudonym. 
um, you know, and but it was a groundbreaking piece of fiction in that it was the first time love between two women was didn't end badly. You know, that one of them didn't either hang themselves or was redeemed by the love of a good man. There's actually a relatively happy ending. So, and I think that even in 2015, that's still refreshing. Catherine, how does Carol fit on your masterpiece scale? Maybe I'm just wildly homophobic, but I have to say... Um, that's how you preface every answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sick of that get out clause, but yeah. <laughs> As a homophobic... No, I don't think I am particularly homophobic. I hope not. But I wasn't moved by Carol. I admired it greatly, but it never moved me. Uh, more than that, I found it a little bit boring, <laughs> I'm afraid, because, uh, and I don't want to give anything away about what happens, but maybe, it, you know, it's meant to be like Brief Encounter. It's meant to play out like that. It, 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 Todd Haynes beautifully references Brief Encounter a lot. Uh, Brief Encounter, you know, it destroys me. Mm. I don't think it's because it's a straight relationship. This, I just was not moved. And I didn't buy them as a couple, I'm afraid. Really? I, yeah, I really mm. didn't. I think individually the performances are strong. I didn't sense there was no chemistry. the attraction. Yeah, it okay. just didn't work for me. Sorry. Um, uh, Up to a point, I know what you mean. Right. And possibly if there's a failing to this film without being a total contradiction in terms, is that it's almost too perfect. It's so mm. perfectly designed and perfectly handled and perfectly acted that you almost want a bit of mess and chaos and naughtiness mm. to kind of engage with. I think I, I, think I agree. Uh, the, the reference to Brief Encounter, it's so overt, it may misdirect audiences and even critics as to be expecting an, mm. an, an, an unhappy ending or at any rate a clouded ending of the sort that David mm. Lean had and that is very very much not really what this does this is very famously not about that this is why it, at the time and now it's considered a, a very subversive gay love story in that it doesn't seek to punish its protagonists mm -hmm. with tragedy so there's that to deal with it's a hugely controlled film and either you kind of submit to that mm. or you chafe against it and I submitted to it to be honest with you I know what you mean by not being moved in that I wasn't choking up with tears mm -hmm. but I certainly thrilled to it I did think that there was chemistry between them I thought there was a terrific chemistry between them I loved the kind of I don't mean this in the sexual sense but emotional sense subdom thing thing that's going on that she's the she's the one in charge yeah and Therese figure played by uh, Rooney Mara has to submit in some sense she's submissive and yet watchful and she could withdraw her love in some in some yeah. mysterious way uh, I love all that I, I thought it was great maybe it isn't I think it kind of is a masterpiece. I don't think it's as much of a masterpiece in a way as Far From Heaven, which had, which in a way had that, had mm. a, something, a kind of demonic flash of mm. something very yes. disturbing yeah, yeah. indeed. And that demonic flash isn't here in Carol, but it's a different sort of thing. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't object to its absence, really. I think it's a superb film. It's yes, it is incredibly superb. narcotic and mm. delicious. Uh, and it foregrounds all those details. I think as a paradox, everything is right. Everything is just so in contradistinction to the transgression and the wrongness that's happening behind your back in a way or behind everybody else's back. Ted Gray's meeting me here and a bunch of us are heading down to Phil's party. You going, aren't you? Yes, I just plan to get there a little. You two go ahead. Are you coming along? No. I uh, have to make a few calls before dinner anyway. I really should run. Thinking of other references, I, I, I mean, Todd Haynes is obviously incredibly cine literate. And I was thinking, it's almost like she's channeling Catherine Hepburn again, and Rooney Mara is channeling Audrey Hepburn. Yes. Uh, yes. And it really had this weird, weird yes. sort of disconnect with the film where you're thinking this is almost like they, they've paired these two up in a film that could have been shot in, in the 50s. I think that's right. But I, for me, the as with something like Truth, Kate Blanchett's other film, this year, uh, you know, Kate Blanchett is, is such a force, and that's why Blue Jasmine was so great. Mm. She's such a force in this, and I know that that's the point, and I know that I see the subdom thing. It's too much for me. I can't. I can't. It doesn't feel. It's 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 a vehicle. The thing about Kate Blanchett is she's a big gun. She's a very. She's one of Hollywood's big guns, mm. and you can't wheel her on mm. and light the fuse and expect to go off quietly. Mm. She's that's a true. massive gun, and it, you're going to get a deafening bang out of it. To be <laughs> honest with you, and that's what happens. But unlike Blue Jasmine, it's not inflected with comedy or irony. Mm. It's absolutely dead straight. Mm. Um, and I didn't have a. 
I didn't have a problem with that. I thought, you, as you, you write, that was your, if I may say so, a masterpiece haiku of the two Hepburns, which you have copyrighted, Zan, and you're absolutely right. It's like a, a mashup of Catherine and Audrey, Audrey Hepburn, uh, and that's absolutely right. Two different styles coming into, coming into, coming into contact. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. That's Todd Haynes's brilliant carol, surely in with a shout in most categories, bar best animation. Which of course is where our next film comes in. It's from Pixar Studios, it's called The Good Dinosaur, and it looks like this. Imagine for a moment that the meteor missed the earth, and the dinosaurs survived, evolved, and prospered. And that a young, timid Apatosaurus called Arlo became separated from his family and hooked up with a feral human child. And if you've imagined this much, you've basically just scripted the first half of The Good Dinosaur. You little love. Peter, this year we've seen a, a really ambitious Pixar film called yeah. Inside Out. This yeah. one is much more conventional. Yeah, I was so disappointed by this, possibly because uh, we were all so in love with Inside Out, which was dazzlingly what Pixar sort of could and should and has been doing, mm. that, that wonderfully complex and, and yet richly emotional film. Yeah. This, frankly, was precisely what we were worried about Pixar before that came out, to be honest with you. I, I mean, it looks very nice, and I've been reading on the web, and this, this movie does have its supporters, but it, that baffles me. I think it's uh, desperately unoriginal, huge borrowings from, I mean, you know, I get that everything looks like The Lion King. Once you've seen like, The Lion King, everything else looks like The Lion mm. King, but this really does half inch The Lion King with a little bit of The Jungle Book, mm -hmm. frankly, and Ice Age and The Cruise. Well, everything, Every Incredible Journey, yeah, yeah. Lassie, it's everything. everything. Yeah, everything. And the idea that, okay, it's, it's a nice idea and the best bit about it is the opening sequence where the, the meteor misses the earth. It might mm. function as quite a funny, Pixar short, this kind of short that they do, in fact, precede their films habitually with. Mm. Uh, but then you're supposed to think, well, the dinosaurs have evolved, or is it just the way that talking animals always are in Disney? If they weren't supposed to have evolved, uh, that's how they'd behave anyway. They'd behave in the same old anthropomorphized way of talking in American accents. Mm. Of course they would. Uh, and the fact that they are coexisting with humans, well, that doesn't, yeah. it's not much of a stretch, so really. So the toys in Toy Story evolved. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's not much of a coexistence than to say, Mowgli coexists with Baloo and talks to him in English, mm. and he talks back in English. That's all it is, really. So I have to say, I just found this boring and derivative and a real, a real downer after Inside Out. Mm. Catherine, did you... How, did, how was the chemistry between Harlow and Spot? <laughs> Harlow and Spot. I, actually, I confess I cried. Oh, I no. cried at the end. I didn't cry in Carol. I didn't cry in Carol. Oh, no. I know. But, uh, that the family no. circle. Yeah, no, I get it. Uh, yeah, oh, it, I get it. they're so flipping efficient. You know, yeah, it's no, really no. amazing. No. I miss my family. Huh? You don't understand. But I mean, I it, it is very boring, uh, a lot of it, especially at the beginning. It just goes on and on. You think, I can't, am I missing something? Mm. And then there's sort of flashes of the Pixar wacky comedy. Mm. There's a great, there's one minute of great footage which is readily available on YouTube where this weird sort of dinosaur comes in with lots of pets on oh, his, yeah. on his mm, trunk. Yeah. And, and they're all kind yeah. of, they're, he's named them all to be very fearsome. This is Fury. He protects me from the creatures that crawl in the night. This is Destructor. She protects me from mosquitoes. This is Dream Crusher. He protects me from having unrealistic goals. And this is Debbie. I really like that bit. That was, and then you sort of think, oh my god, maybe it'll mm. be more interesting. And then there's a weird acid trip. Mm. So you've got this incredible conventionality with sort of LSD, you know, coming mm. in occasionally, but not enough. Mm. And then you know, it's meant to, you're meant to admire it because it's got all this photorealistic wave. Yeah, you yeah. think, oh, what's the point? You might as well just watch, you might as well just shoot it yeah. normally. <laughs> so, yeah, screensaver. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it is boring. But I was, I, I did, I did well out. It was incredible. They are. Brilliant, I'm afraid, in, 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 in a shameless way. Sometimes you gotta get through your fear. 
to see the beauty on the other side. dinosaur middling movie and belatedly we return to the world of men and a true life tale of Boston's criminal underworld embodied by Johnny Depp via the medium of prosthetics. In the beginning Jim was a small town player. Johnny Depp is James Whitey Bulger, ringleader of the Winter Hill Gang on the south side of Boston. He's working for Joel Edgerton's compromised FBI agent except that maybe Edgerton is really working for him. The city is a sty, and everyone comes out muddy. Catherine, it seems that Johnny Depp's been bored out of his mind for so long, and at least he's kind of going for it here, even if sometimes to a fault. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's good. But um, he's still in love with makeup and, and wigs and stuff in a way that is actively unhelpful here. I think if this film had had anyone else in the lead, someone who didn't feel the need to slather themselves in all this crap, then it might have, you might have been able to buy it. But for me, there was always this big problem that you have in this kind of, you know, very serious gangster talk. And nobody says... This guy, you know, mm. what's with his eyes and what's his teeth? Has he got? There's something. <laughs> he's got something stuck there, <laughs> you know, which really let it down for me. I, I don't think it's career best work. I think it's sort of just absolutely hobbles the whole. In film. many ways, it's a, a great film, but I did keep thinking, oh look, there's Johnny Depp yeah, acting. He's got some. <laughs> like, those eyes look really <laughs> odd, and it's just it just any attempt at sort of uh, verisimilitude just let down by the fact that you've got this freaky clown thing. <laughs> In the middle. John, do you know what I do to rats? It ain't ratting, Jimmy. It's an alliance. An alliance between me and the FBI. No, no, between you and me. And it absolutely does glamorise it. You know, it's the only point, the only way you'd enjoy this, really, is by thinking they're pretty cool. And, you know, him kind of killing all these people is pretty cool. And it is, it is, it is a bit distasteful, I'm afraid. Uh, I didn't think it was good I think I thought for me the one thing that was sort of good was when other people who are better actors than Johnny Depp or certainly Johnny Depp in all mm. this crap brought it and yeah. like Peter Sarsgaard has a has yeah. a sort of good two scenes as a really coked up sort of semi-Mexican guy <laughs> which and I thought they were engaging and he was good and it sort of exposed yet further the the lack of, of innate brilliance in Johnny Depp. And, and you've got good promises from Joel Edgerton as the FBI guy and Benedict Cumberbatch as, yeah. as Bulger's brother, I, who's a sort of Massachusetts state senator. I, I have to say, I don't, I don't really agree with Catherine. I mean, I know what you mean about the baldness. It is a bit, it is a bit absurd. But I don't agree. I think Black Mass has interesting things to say about gangsterism that are hardly ever said, that the gangsters don't just arise like supervillains out of nowhere. Mm. They are created by corrupt politicians. Well, yeah, he's very careful. He doesn't use phones, that kind of stuff. And uh, who did you say these other informants were? I didn't. Now, it's not, it, it's not absolutely original to say that, but it's certainly as original, more original than many other yeah. gangster stories. And I personally think there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's stylistic, of course, it's very unoriginal. It looks a bit like Goodfellas quite a lot of yeah. the time. And he even has a kind of funny how scene, uh, a kind of sub Joe Pesci funny how scene, which it's I thought- The steak yeah, marinade. The steak marinade scene, which I thought was kind of outrageously pinched from Goodfellas. What's the family secret recipe? It's, gr it's ground garlic. A little bit of soy. That's it? Yeah, that's it. That's it. I thought it was a family secret. But having said that, I think it's very watchable and it does have something to say about the world of gangsters, which most gangster films actually, most superior gangster films, stylistically and, and better acted gangster films, don't say. In, there is a kind of weird, unexpected high-mindedness to Black Mass and I have to say I thought it was very good. Listen, from what I hear, his criminal days are all but over. His, his partner and him, they gone legit. Christ, Carly. Is Whitey never using phones and careful, or is Whitey retired? So we've had the mass and the carol, the children's trinket and the snowy city street. I guess that counts as a Christmas of sorts. My thanks to Peter and to Catherine and to you for watching. We're back next week. Father Flood sponsored me and he found me a job. They told you a date for the nylon sale yet, Hamish. Oh, dear God. I thank you to keep his name out of a conversation about nylons.